Dear Christian friends, they were in slavery, and he brought them out. They were thirsty, and he struck a rock, and water came gushing forth for them to drink. They were trapped, and he parted the sea to provide them a way out. He wrote the first five books of the Old Testament. His name was Moses. You can see why in many people's view, especially among the Hebrews, Moses was considered to be the greatest among all the prophets. This morning we focus on the words from Hebrews chapter 3, where the writer to the Hebrews encourages us to fix our thoughts on Jesus. First, because Jesus was faithful, just like Moses was faithful. And secondly, because Jesus is worthy of greater honor than Moses. The letter of the Hebrews was, was written to a church in persecution. Christianity wasn't always met with open arms. It wasn't always popular. And it wasn't always legal. To that early Christian church, they would be facing fierce opposition. On the one hand, opposition from the Jews who were jealous and angry that people were following Jesus because they rejected him as the true Messiah. On the other hand, the emperor wanted to make sure his throne was maintained. And he made sure that everybody in his kingdom recognized him as a god. They would do this by bowing down before his throne and by burning some incense to recognize his deity. Amongst opposition like this, it was easy temptation then for these new Christians to go back to the way things were, to go back to serving under Judaism without Christ. They were tempted to go back to Moses and all the laws that Moses had laid out for them. But the encouragement is this. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. Of course, for us here today, not many of us are too tempted to set up that old system of sacrifice and all those Old Testament laws. Neither are we really persecuted the way these early Christians were. In the U.S., we get a lot of freedoms that are wonderful blessings from God. And we're probably never going to be asked to either renounce Jesus or die. So how does this scripture apply to us? Well, in the first place, all of us have that old Adam inside of us. That old Adam wants nothing to do with Jesus. He wants nothing to do with God. In fact, if anything, he wants to oppose God. The, bi the big issue here for a lot of people is that we can let our lives fill up with stuff that doesn't have anything to do with God. Now, don't get me wrong. There is something to be said for Christian families, Christian occupations, and living out your entire life as a sacrifice. And yet, when we fill our lives with things, we can push God out. We can neglect thinking about Him. We can neglect His Word. We can be more concerned with going to work, more concerned with our families, and more concerned with relaxation time than we are with God. And what about money? For a lot of people, that's a big issue as well. It's always running through the back of their minds. How can I get this? How am I going to pay that bill? How can I get that? Now, all these things end up crowding out God from our lives. And it's a slippery slope we go down. Sure, we probably wouldn't ever come to the point where we would say, I renounce Jesus. I don't want to be a Christian anymore. But as you go down that slope, there is still a point at which God can be completely crowded out of your life with all the other stuff in it. So the encouragement for us today is fix your thoughts on Jesus. In this section, 
the writer to the Hebrews is actually holding Moses in quite high regard. See, in no way does he bring Moses down in order to make Christ look better. He commends Moses for all that he did. After all, he was a great prophet. He did a lot of miracles, and he was God's instrument to bringing, his peop bringing God's people up out of Egypt. You really don't want to badmouth Moses, and certainly not to the Hebrews. Again, as I had mentioned before, the Hebrews would have said Moses was the top dog. He was the best of all the prophets, and you really didn't want to speak against Moses. So to be fair, this writer to the Hebrews says, yes, Moses did a good job. He was faithful. Moses was appointed as, as Israel's prophet. He spoke with God, and he mediated between God and the people. On the one hand, Moses represented the people, and he constantly pleaded with God to not be overcome with anger for the people's sins. He prayed to God that he remember his promises, and that he remember not to wipe the people out because he'd already promised to bring them into the promised land. Also as prophet, Moses then spoke with God and took that word to the people. You can remember what happened on Mount Sinai when God gave Moses the, the two tablets of stone to carry back down to the people, the Ten Commandments. He also wrote down everything that God had told him to write down so that God's people would not forget, but instead remember what God had said, all the promises that he had made, and also to observe all the laws that God had set in place. Moses was a very faithful servant. By comparison, Jesus is also faithful. In our section from Hebrews, it says that Jesus was an apostle. In fact, it's the only, it's the only portion of Scripture that says that Jesus is an apostle. So what does that mean? Well, an apostle is somebody who's sent on a mission by God. He's a missionary of sorts. In the case of Jesus, his specific mission was to come and to deal with sin. He came to bring us up out of slavery. Just how Moses brought the people out of slavery from Egypt, Christ brings us out of the slavery of sin and the devil. He did this by living the life that we weren't able to and by dying that death that we deserved. He also preached God's word to the people. I'm sure there's several times that you can think of where in the New Testament, Jesus preaches to the people. To those who are penitent, he said, you're forgiven. But to those self-righteous Pharisees, he had to come down with the law and say, no, you're not forgiven. Jesus also spoke to God for the people. Again, he stood between the people and between God as our mediator. He prayed to God for those people. But more than that, he was also the payment for all our sins. He's the reason that God doesn't have to be angry with us. He made satisfaction for everything that we've done. The most important function of the high priest was to offer a sacrifice for the sins of the people. And that's exactly what Jesus did. But unlike those, unlike those Old Testament high priests who had to continually offer sacrifices over and over again, Jesus only offered one sacrifice, once and for all. Because the sacrifice that Jesus offered was acceptable. It was permanent. So he didn't have to do it two or three or a hundred times, but only once. Also, unlike those Old Testament high priests, Jesus had no need to offer a sacrifice first for his own sins and then one for the sins of the people. Instead, Jesus himself had no sin whatsoever. For all these reasons and even more, 
Christ is the high priest to end all high priests. Again, in this section, the writer doesn't have to bring Moses down in order to make Christ look good. He gives them both a thumbs up. He gives them both the same grade. That grade was faithful. Now, of course, both Moses and Jesus didn't have the same mission. They had different missions that God had sent them on. But the grade they got for that mission was the same. It's sort of like Moses graduates from high school with straight A's. Good job. Yet Christ's mission was something far greater. It's kind of like graduating magna cum laude, or excuse me, summa cum laude from the university by comparison. As much as you want to hold Moses up, you've got to hold Jesus up all the more. That's why we want, to, we want to fix our thoughts on Jesus, because he's that much more important than Moses. And that's why he deserves greater honor than Moses, because what he achieved was something far greater. Just like when you look at a, a, a building or some piece of architecture, I think of the St. Louis Arch that I recently saw. You know, as you look at that, and you think, that's a really quite a magnificent structure. Quite striking. And it's not something like anything else you'd ever see. As you look at something like that, you think to yourself, I wonder how they got that up there. I wonder who did that. But finally, it's not the structure itself that gets all the praise. It's whoever put it there. The craftsman and the architect and whoever put it up, they get all the credit here. In a similar way, whatever you can say about Moses, you have to say also about God. Because, of course, Moses was only God's instrument. He was God's creation. So as great as Moses was, and as wonderful as the things that he did were, you still have to give the glory back to God for making Moses in the first place. Now, as Moses served, he had a message to bring the, to the people. And it wasn't just the do's and the don'ts of the law. Moses also wrote down all the promises that God had given to his people. The promises to Adam and Eve, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those promises to bring his people up out of slavery in Egypt, but more importantly, to save them from their sins by sending that Savior. Jesus is the fulfillment of all those prophecies. Yes, in Moses, God did make good on his promise to bring his people back to that promised land, but he gives us something far greater than just a nice place to live. He takes away all our sins. In Jesus, we have someone who became like us so that he could live in our place. He fulfilled all of God's laws. He never once put God in second or third or fourth place in his life, but he always honored him, always in first place as he should. That's why you see Jesus going to the temple. Maybe you remember the time that Jesus went to the temple and overturned the tables of the, of the uh, money changers because he was so zealous for the, for the worship of God in his temple. Of course, then again, all the times that Jesus preached to the people, showing how important to him God was. Jesus lived his life perfectly, the way that we should have. But it didn't end there. Jesus went all the way to the cross. He suffered and died the death that you and I deserve, because somebody had to pay that, that sacrifice. Somebody had to pay that debt. As for Moses, he was a faithful servant. And he's commended for that later on in, in the letter to the Hebrews. It says this about him. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, 
because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and a sprinkling of blood so that the destroyer, destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. This is taken from Hebrews chapter 11, which is probably the most famous chapter of that book. We call it the Heroes of Faith chapter. And in that chapter, there is example after example of God's people throughout the Old Testament who did amazing acts for God and His people. But behind all that is the faith that they had. In the, por in the portion of Scripture we just read there, there's three times that Moses is commended for his works by faith. Just as Moses had every right to stay in, his, in Pharaoh's house and continue on living that life of royalty, he chose to abandon all that as a willing servant. It wasn't like God cracked the whip and got him to go. He wanted to because he believed what God had said. But where Moses is pictured as a servant, Christ is the master. It says that Moses helped out the house, God's house, but that Christ was the son of that house. It means he's the heir and really the owner of that house. You and I are his house. And Christ looks out for us all the time. Of course, he protects us from harm and danger. He rescues us from fear. But he also uses all of history to make sure that every single one of his elect come to faith through hearing his word and through baptism and be preserved in that faith, again, by hearing his word and through communion. Christ works out all of history so that the right people are put in your life to make sure that you came to faith and that you stay in it until the end. And whether we pass away first or whether Christ comes back, either way, Christ is making sure that all these events play out properly so that at the end, we get to go home with Him in heaven. So fix your thoughts on Jesus and hold firmly to Him by faith. Because we trust in Him so much, we can brag about it. We can brag in our Savior and what He has done. He's got a message that nobody else has that says that He's done everything for us so that we don't have to do anything. He brings us up out of our sins, out of death, and out of the clutches of the devil to bring us peace and joy and finally heaven when, when we finally get to be taken home to be with Him. So when we face opposition, either from scientists or historians that say they've disproven the Bible, we can stand up in confidence and say, no, we know better. When those friends or relatives of ours say that they think that Christianity is just foolishness, again, we cling to Christ. We fix our thoughts on Jesus. Amen.